in this world, you can find the outliers who easily attract things into their life. And they're highly valued people. You know, they accomplish great things, but they make it look effortless. You may or may not have met somebody like this in your lifetime, but you will hear about them. Their names are gonna come up in conversations. They attract all the right opportunities. Other people are drawn to them. They easily earn more money and they seem to have endless energy and they're always happy. They break barriers in this game called life and they easily change their circumstances. And the thing is, is they have more fun because they make their own rules. So I want to share something very interesting from this book here from Malcolm Gladwell. I read this a long time ago. It's a great book. Uh, I like The Tipping Point, but this is probably his second best book in my opinion. Definitely pick this up and read it if you have a chance. But I want to read something that I highlighted. I actually highlighted quite a bit in chapter four, I think it is here. This is my favorite part of the book and I want to share it here. There was a fascinating study from a sociologist, but what she concluded were there were two parenting philosophies and they divided almost perfectly along class lines. The wealthier parents raised their kids in one way and the poorer parents raised their kids in another way. I'm going to read directly from this book that I highlighted. The wealthier parents were heavily involved in their children's free time, shuttling them from one activity to the next, quizzing them about their teachers, their coaches, and their teammates. Very hands-on was the more wealthy established parents. These wealthier parents, and they were middle class, but wealthier than the poor kids. What these parents did is they talked things through with their children, reasoning with them. They didn't just issue commands, they expected their children to talk back to them, to negotiate, to question adults in positions of authority, and to challenge the teachers. The poor parents, by contrast, are intimidated by authority. They react passively and they stay in the background. Poor parents tend to follow, by contrast, a strategy of accomplishment of natural growth. Meaning they see as their responsibility to care for their children, but to let them grow and develop on their own. In other words, not pushing them or coaxing them to learn faster. On the other hand, the heavily scheduled Wealthier class kids are exposed to constantly shifting, a constantly shifting set of experiences. They learn teamwork, how to cope in highly structured settings. Um, she's taught how to interact comfortably with adults and to speak up when she needs to. In other words, the middle class children learn a sense of entitlement. Huge difference the way they upbring. It was very interesting. I'm going to read the rest of this. They acted as though they had the right to pursue their own individual preferences and to actively manage interactions in institutional settings. They appeared comfortable in those settings. They were open to sharing information and asking for attention. They made special requests of teachers and doctors to adjust procedures and to accommodate their desires. By contrast, the working class poor children were characterized by an emerging sense of distance, distrust, and constraint. They didn't know how to get their way or how to customize. In one telling scene, the researcher described a visit to the doctor by the wealthier parents. They were bringing the boy, which was, his name was Alex. I'm going to read you the dialogue here. The mother, Christina, but they were from a wealthy family. The mother says, Alex, you should be asking, or you should be thinking of questions you might want to ask the doctor. And she asks, she says this to him on the car ride to the doctor's office. She says, ask him anything that you want to ask him. Don't be shy, ask anything, right? The doctor tells Alex he's in the 95th percentile in height. And then Alex, the boy interrupts and says, I'm in what? The doctor says, it means that you're taller than more than 95 out of 100 young men, 
when they're uh 10 years old the doctor stutters alex i'm not 10. doctor well they graft you at 10. you're nine years and 10 months they they the doctor stutters usually take the closest year to graph. You see, Alex interrupts the doctor saying, I'm not 10. That's entitlement. His mother permits that casual inclivity because she wants him to learn to, her, to assert himself with people in positions of authority. He's behaving much as he does with his parents. He reasons, negotiates, and jokes with equal ease. So it, this is okay. Now, Here's the punchline. The sense of entitlement that he has been taught is an attitude perfectly suited to succeeding in the modern world. I thought that was very profound. So that is why I wanted to share that in regards to the outliers in this world. It's not that their IQ is higher. It has really doesn't have anything to do with IQ. It has nothing to do with talent either. It's more of cultivating that type of personality. But here's the harsh reality. Most people don't realize it, but right now you're being pushed into complacency and you're actually being tranquilized into passivity. And I'll explain a little bit about that a little later. But think about this. While these outliers are thriving and the rest of us are being lulled to sleep, we don't even see it coming. Because you may think you're comfortable right now, but you're stuck. You're trapped in a system that wants to keep you distracted. They want to keep you tired and they want to keep you unfocused. So in this system, what ends up happening with a lot of people is they get held back from even being able to tap into that same unstoppable drive that those outliers have. They have the same chance, but they're being blocked. Now the difference between them isn't the talent like i said it's not the iq it's the ability to break free from the trappings that are keeping you in the low energy mediocre mind frame okay so what i want to do i'm going to be quoting some scripture as well from this bible i have here okay i'm reading proverbs chapter 6 verse 9. this is a powerful one how long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come to you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. I hope that sinks in because a lot of people, it seems like you look, you look at the world, right? You look at some people and it seems like they don't even really care about being successful. Let me clarify something. When I say success, because some people are just going to assume that I'm talking about fame and fortune because fame and fortune is just a small superficial aspect of success. And when I'm talking about success, I'm talking about achievement. And that is a very expansive topic that I can't break down in this video. But I do understand that there are plenty of people who are driven and focused on success in general, but I want to, for some reason, I just want to talk to the people who seem indifferent. Those who act like they don't care. I want to shake them out of their, their uh, apathy and tell them, hey, wake up. You don't want to be stuck in this cycle. You think it's all good right now, but they're rocking you to sleep and you don't even realize it. It's like you're a frog in lukewarm water on the stove. It's going to feel comfortable now, but soon the water is going to be at a rapid boil and you won't even see it coming. Comfort is overrated because you're going to have plenty of time for comfort in the end when it's all over. So let me read another uh, from Ecclesiastes here. See, I have everything marked here. You see these, uh, I don't know if you can see them, but these are little sticky notes where it keeps your place. I find them very convenient. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 it says whatever your hands find to do do it with all your might for in the realm of the dead where you are going we're all going by the way there is neither work nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom it reminds you that your time is limited so you should use the time that you have 
to do what you want to do with all your might, directed toward your purpose. And I think in order to become strong enough to escape the comfort of that slow boil that I was just talking about, we need two things in abundance, and that's focus and energy. These two factors are critical, and they need to skyrocket for us to succeed. You see, focus and energy go hand in hand, and without energy, you can only push so far before you burn out, and you need to spend so much time recuperating. And then on the flip side, if you have energy, but you lack the focus, you're just scattering your energy everywhere with no real direction. And I take it from me, I know this from experience. When I was younger, all I had was massive amounts of energy that I was just spraying in all directions. So basically, I was lost without a clear purpose to dedicate myself to and stay dedicated to it. I mean, I had a, a vague sense of what I wanted, but I got sidetracked easy. Even back then, without social media being what it is today, distractions still pulled me off course. So let me quote something from the Tao Te Ching. Great little book here. Let me read chapter 33. It says, he who knows others is clever. He who knows himself has discernment. He who overcomes others has force. He who overcomes himself is strong. So, in other words, it takes greater strength to overcome your own fears, your own impulses and ego. Meaning, self-mastery is the ultimate strength. Don't focus on controlling the world. Instead, focus on controlling yourself. And the rest of it here, he who knows contentment is rich. I don't know if you can see that. Contentment brings an internal richness that external wealth cannot provide. True abundance is a state of mind. And you know, the irony is that you can attract more external riches when your internal contentment is rich. He who perseveres is a man of purpose. A person that has perseverance has a deeper sense of meaning in life. You got to understand that your perseverance is derived from the strength of your purpose and meaning. So he who has a strong enough why can bear any how. He who does not lose his station will endure. So basically, your station in life represents your moral compass. Whether it's integrity, humility, or any other value. The stability in your character is what leads to longevity. It leads to success and fulfillment. In the last line here, he who lives out his days has had a long life. A long life. You see, what Lao Tzu means is that a long life is more than just a number of days that you live. It's more about how you live those days. It's more than just living a lengthy life or living a lengthy but miserable life. Rather, it's, ha it's living a shorter but more meaningful life. The shorter but more meaningful life is a more fulfilling life. So, you might have read it somewhere else, but it, it, you, you know, another translation would say that he who conquers others is strong and he who conquers himself is mighty. But you really got to meditate on some of these things that are being said because it could be kind of difficult to understand. That's why I wanted to break it down. But when you conquer yourself, think about this. It's even harder to conquer ourselves now because we're bombarded with more distractions and more things that drain our energy. Whether it's the endless, you know, products with suspect ingredients on the store shelves or the constant notifications on our phones. Ironically, in this era, when we need more focus and energy than ever before to achieve something great, it's harder to find it. And years ago, you didn't, when, when these scriptures were written, you didn't need as much energy and focus to succeed because there weren't as many distractions and you can focus on your objective for long periods of time. But now, it's definitely a different dimension that we live in. That's the reality. So. What do we do? Let's look at the acronym here that I have for DRIVE. 
you can write this down for drive D R I V E. It's dedication, resilience, initiative, vision, and enthusiasm. The dedication to build resilience with initiative toward your vision with enthusiasm. Because I believe the drive, all capital letters, to succeed is instilled in everyone. But we need to recognize that focus and energy are the keys to unlocking that drive. Corinthians, this is another one that I like. Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Material prizes are meaningless. The crown that doesn't last, but the intrinsic prizes last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. So, if you have your eyes on the intrinsic prize, you can't lose because most people want the glitter. And they don't see the value of hard work toward purpose. And some don't even know the value in finding their purpose at all. They only know the purpose that was given to them. They can't resist their lower nature. They can't resist the pull of distractions. And they can't resist the temptations that destroy them. They can't even resist the things that are being sold to them on a daily basis. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So, in other words, pick your target in life. Make sure it's the target that you want to hit over all other targets. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 Do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, perfect will. You see, the opposite of courage is conformity. Earl Nightingale said that. In order to test out what your best life would be, you have to constantly renew your mind and renew the way you look at things. Your consciousness has to expand Look, there's nothing new under the sun, but the world is changing fast and most people are focused on celebrity gossip and bobblehead politicians instead of their futures. The population is growing and companies are pushing for machines, automation, and AI to take over more of our lives. So, you know, for example, I think the whole healthcare industry is gonna be one of the first industries to be completely revolutionized by AI and robotics because AI is available to get the job done 24 hours a day. It doesn't have human error. It can process a large amount of information at a fraction of the speed that humans can. Human doctors, no matter how experienced they are, they have biases, they, they get tired and fatigued. They make unintentional mistakes. AI can operate without these limitations. That's only one example of one industry. When you think about it, if we have more people, the population is growing, and we're gonna have less available jobs, what do you think that means? It's a serious question. I hope you're starting to make the connection now with the times that are approaching. Because as technology advances, people are losing their interpersonal skills. You can see it in the poor quality customer service. You see, years ago, we smiled and greeted customers. It raised the energy in the environment. Now workers don't even know how to acknowledge that you're there. With all the anti-social behavior and social awkwardness, it's ironic that people are starting to reflect the cold nature of these machines. They lack emotion. They lack sincerity. It's like they're drifting through life like leaves just blowing in the wind. Is that what you really want? To just float along letting the powers that be decide your direction, to be swept up in the current with no control over where you're headed. Let me read from Matthew here. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. 
and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life and only few will find it. If you want what most people don't have, you gotta be willing to do what most people won't do. Imagine you're the fish in Finding Nemo. You know, the one that's stuck in the tank high up on that skyscraper? And you're waiting for somebody to open that window so you can escape. And you see that moment right there, that moment of freedom is within your grasp. But here's the truth. Not everyone is gonna take that leap. Most wanna stay in the comfort of their glass cage and they're afraid to take that jump. And you know what, that's fine. Let them stay there. One of the hardest truths in life is realizing that you can't take everyone with you. Not everyone is ready. And trying to drag them along is only gonna bother them and hold you back. You gotta make the decision to break free on your own, even if it's tough. But I mean, ask yourself, what's the alternative? Stay stuck or take the leap into something greater? Let me, let me quote the Bhagavad Gita. I got the, the Bhagavad Gita as it is. Okay, a man must elevate himself by his own mind, not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. Your mind is your friend or your foe. You know, you have to lift yourself by yourself, never degrade yourself, because self-help is the best help. I was thinking about this earlier. I'm a black sheep, always have been, even as a kid. Just a little snot-nosed kid. I'd look around and I'd think, what's going on with this place? This is weird. Like, how did I end up here in this world where people go to work all day, come home, and complain about work one minute, and then complain about bills the next minute? It's like, if you slave around at work all day, shouldn't you have the luxury of not needing to complain about bills anymore? So even as a young kid, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, what the fuck? We're human beings. There has to be a better way. We want to play. We want to enjoy life. We want to do what we want to do. So why aren't we? So let me quote the Tao Te Ching one more time. So it says, in the pursuit of learning, one knows more every day. In the pursuit of the way one does less every day. One does less and less until one does nothing at all. And when one does nothing at all, there is nothing that is undone. It is always through not meddling that the empire is won. Should you meddle, then you're not equal to the task of winning the empire. So in other words, the world is won by those who let go. But when you try and try and try, the world is beyond winning. And that's why it's so important to monetize your passion, man. That way you can play for the rest of your life and get paid for it. Let me say that again. Monetize your passion. People brag about their benefits like, yeah, I got medical and I got dental and a 401k. And I'm over here like, oh yeah, 401k, huh? Congratulations. Never mind putting that into stocks and ETFs that you've researched, that you can watch and you can understand how these financial institutions work. Instead, you let them take your money, put it where they want, and then they have more control over your money than you do. You can't touch it. You can't take it out. That's not a winning strategy, no. The clock is ticking. Capitalize on your strengths and make it your job to monetize your passion. Get on top of that shit. Let me quote the Bhagavad Gita one more time. Chapter three, verse 35. It is far better to discharge one's prescribed duties, even though they may be faulty, than another's duties, even though they may be perfectly done. Basically, what it means is you're doing what you were meant to do based on your individuality and your strengths is better to fail at doing that than it is to win at doing somebody else's 
duties that were prescribed to you by someone else. Whether you were persuaded to do it or whether you were convinced to do it by society, you weren't going out on your own. So, it continues, destruction in the course of performing one's own duty is better than engaging in another's duties, for to follow another path is dangerous. That's like when you climb the corporate ladder because society said it's good, it's a good job or it's a good career, and you get to the top of that ladder and you're like, damn, it's leaning against the wrong wall. And by then it's pretty much almost too late for a lot of people. You see, it's about doing what you were meant to do. That's why it's so important to capitalize on your strengths because you're living out your full potential if you do that. But if you work some job just for some money or because somebody else wants you to do it and they think it's a good career path and you climb the corporate ladder and you get to the top of the corporate ladder and then you realize the ladder's leaning up against the wrong wall, that's the danger that it was talking about in this book. Once you realize this, you understand that it's a cold realization to become comfortable with. But if you're a black sheep like me, an outcast, a lone wolf, you don't see the point in all this societal BS. The belief systems that we've been indoctrinated into that we blindly accept, they only make sense to those who control it, but they don't make sense to you. People say, well, that's the way it is, or this is what we're supposed to do because this is what we've always done. You know, but for people like us, the curious ones, the thinkers, once we start digging, we see through that structure. And when you finally understand what's really going on, you realize, wait a minute, I don't want to be part of this trap. I mean, you know, and there's probably moments where you might think maybe I should just go along with the masses and do like all the others do. But there's a price to pay for that. People do it all the time. They know something isn't right, but they'd rather not ruffle any feathers. They just go along to get along. And I thought about it too. I mean, if I did that, I'd actually feel more alone that way. So at least now I can live with myself for having integrity and, and being authentic. Because if I gave in and I you know, went with the herd, I wouldn't be alone in the physical, but I'd feel alone ethically. And that's worse, much worse. There's no point in living an average life. I don't know, maybe this is part of my evolution, but I'd rather stand out as the black sheep and get fingers pointed at me than to blend in with the herd. So you gotta ask yourself, are you actually falling asleep in this system? Or will you wake up, step out, and freely own your life? The choice is yours, but you gotta remember this. The clock is ticking. So, that's pretty much sums it up for me. I, I, want, I want to thank you guys for watching this video. And just know that whatever the next level is for you, it is closer than you think. So keep jumping to the next level, and we'll talk to you on the next one.